today we are going to be working through relational evangelism. And uh, I don't know how you feel about that. Some of you are like already gung-ho, maybe you already practice relational evangelism. Some of you are very hesitant or fearful as we begin to talk about it. And so before we dig into the activity itself, I actually want to just present you with a few misconceptions that we might have about relational evangelism. And I want to hopefully take each one of those misconceptions off the table and correct them with what the Bible teaches us, okay? So what are some misconceptions about evangelism? I'm going to share with you three of them. The first one is, it's about trying to control someone with the goal of getting them to make a decision to go to heaven. Now, this is a misconception because clearly we can see in Jesus' life that the goal of evangelism is not control, but it's love. Jesus so so clearly showed this to us in his life and his ministry. So it isn't really about finding someone now and making them your project so you can control them because people aren't projects. There's a project, sure, it's called the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and everyone's invited, but they might not know it yet. And so that's what evangelism exists for, is inviting them into that. And so as we per, uh, pursue relational evangelism, we aren't out to you know, attack someone for their beliefs or to, you know, shove our faith down their throat. But we want to, our tone to be one of humility and gentleness and patience and respect and the kind that actually invites somebody um, and, and, is, and is actually draws them out, starts to learn more about them in the process. Okay, so that's misconception number one. The second misconception is that you don't think uh, you'll know enough or you might fear that you'll be unsuccessful in your goal. And I need to put goal in quotes because that's, again, kind of a misconception about what our goal is. Because the truth is love is not only the motivation, but it's also the goal. Our goal is to actually love people. And, and in pursuing that goal, uh, it's really helpful to just remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 28, that he says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. We don't have to be fearful. We need to be faithful in the call to go make disciples. So God will give you what you need. You don't have to fear uh, being unsuccessful in your goal. Third, it's all riding on us. <laughs> okay, this is the last one. It, it's not true that it's all riding on us, even though it might sometimes feel that way, but it's not. We're not, it's not all riding on us because we're not the Holy Spirit, right? And we can't save people. It, our job is actually to partner with the Holy Spirit, but we're not the Holy Spirit. And we partner with Him by faithfully pursuing people whom He has placed in our lives, whether that's in a moment where we meet someone new or in someone who we have a deep relationship with or anywhere in between. And so, sum all that up. Pursuing relational evangelism means loving someone with the inviting heart of God that they might experience uh, new life in Him. We're inviting them to new life in Jesus Christ that they might not just experience that new life in Him, but that they might now live for Him. And it's really important to remember that we don't need to be uh, theologians or, you know, really crazy, special, smart people in order to do this. God's used plenty of people from all different walks of life, including in the New Testament, a lot of uneducated people. And He used them powerfully because that's just how His Holy Spirit works, through people and through uh, relationships. And so He gets the glory, not us. Now, as we continue to move through this exercise, I want to share with you from 1 Peter chapter 3. And I want to share this with you because I think sometimes uh, we've got to remember the commission that we've been given. Okay, so let's read this. What does it say? But set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. So if He's not Lord in your hearts, there's no sense in... Uh, seeking to do relational evangelism, and always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope that you possess. Yet do it with courtesy and respect, keeping a good conscience, so that those who slander your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame when they accuse you. 
Whoa, 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 Peter, what are you talking about here? Peter is drawing a straight line between sharing your faith in Christ and suffering for Christ. There's usually one of two responses to sharing your faith the person's salvation or your suffering. Now, there's often plenty of things in between, but those two are, are contrasted here by Peter. And the point is, is that we need to be people who are always ready to suffer for Christ in such a way as we're ready to actually put ourselves out there and to suffer for His name. But even to give an answer, as it says, to anyone who asks about the hope that you possess. Now, step one in being able to give that answer is to actually have some sort of context for the conversation. And so, step one is having spiritual conversations. Spiritual conversations are pretty simple. It's really just getting spiritual things on the radar of the relationship. And so it's in love learning more about the person that you're talking to. And to be honest, you might be surprised at how many people are very willing to have a spiritual conversation. They're actually eager to. They just don't have a lot of people that actually care and are worth, are, uh, will trouble themselves to ask the question. And so two questions you can ask to have a spiritual conversation with someone. Do you have any spiritual beliefs? And who do you think Jesus is? All you're doing is learning more about that person out of love and hopefully getting Jesus on their radar. Maybe they have a lot of ideas about who Jesus is. Maybe they don't have a clue and you get to share. Whatever the case, it's a great conversation starter and a great way for you to start to bring Jesus into the conversation so that you can then be vulnerable with them by giving an answer. Now, we're gonna practice this together in just a moment. We're gonna practice giving an answer. And we're going to do it in a safe and loving environment in our groups so that we're a little bit more thoughtful about how we might do it in the context of a non-Christian relationship that we have. And so when we're thinking about practicing this uh, today, but also into the future in an actual situation, we're not talking about sealing the deal. We're talking about planting a seed. We're talking about giving an answer for the hope that we possess. And so we're, what we're trying to do is we're learning to defend our faith without being defensive. <laughs> Defensiveness is when I'm trying to keep my own reputation or trying to protect myself. But defend is when I'm actually able to articulate that hope that I possess in Christ. So in, in giving an answer, share with your group, first question, why are you a Christian? And perhaps you'll get asked a question like that at some point from an unbeliever. And this is really all about uh, being able to give an answer as to the hope that you possess. Why are you a Christian? Now, if you're not a Christian and you're in one of our community groups right now, great. Very thankful that you're there. Perhaps instead of answering the question, why are you a Christian, you're going to answer the question, why are you not a Christian? What's standing in the way of you becoming a Christian? But for the rest of us, why are you a Christian? Second, who is someone whom you can have a spiritual conversation with this week? And a couple of things to think about when you're planning for that conversation. Is this someone who you know you're going to see this week? Or is it someone that you need to actually stop and set aside some time to get together with? If so, when is that going to be? Is it someone that you kind of see sporadically? If so, you're going to have to actually put yourself in a position where you'll be in their path and you'll have a greater degree of intentionality required in order to actually have that conversation with them. So who is someone you can have a spiritual conversation with this week and actually set aside a plan to do that? And lastly, who is someone you can invite to our church gathering, that's a Sunday gathering, or a group gathering, someone to come to your group? And as you plan for these things, uh, I want to encourage you each to follow up with one another. As, as you share those plans with one another this week, and then say, for example, oh, I'm going to talk to so-and-so on Friday, send a text out to the group on Friday and let them know that you're going to go into that conversation so they can be praying, let them know how it went, and all those kinds of things. And, and for those of you who are in the group and you're receiving those texts, I want to encourage you, offer that person encouragement and feedback and 
helpful suggestions as you continue, as they continue to pursue that person in the future. And as you conclude this time with your group this week, just spend some time praying for those people and those conversations as you prepare for them.